church, if you would go ahead and open your Bibles to the book of Genesis. We're going to begin this morning in chapter 12 as we continue our trek through what we are calling the story. This morning we're going to look at God in his unstoppable plan of, of creating a nation and calling a nation to himself and then commissioning the nation of Israel to be a light for the nations. So far, we have seen God creating the heavens and the earth. Richard asked the question, what is it that God has done that deserves a standing ovation from us? Well, everything that God has done deserves a standing ovation from us. Amen? Amen. Because great are his works. Great is his faithfulness. And we serve him because of his goodness. So God creates this world, and then the world turns against him. He creates man and woman in his own image and, and gives them this choice that they have to make of whether they're going to follow God's plan or they're going to follow their own plan. And they chose to follow their own plan. And, and so God has been, since that time, trying to redeem the world back to himself. God divided the nations when they decided to make a name for themselves by building this giant tower on the plain of Shinar. They wanted to make a name for themselves, and God says, no, we don't. it's about my name, it's not about your name. And so God divided the nations, and he scattered the nations in order to preserve the nations, and then he called one nation to himself to declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among the peoples, in order that the nations might be reconciled to him. One God one plan, one story. And I think this morning it's fitting that this particular message falls on Father's Day. Because in calling to himself a nation that God is going to create and then commission to make his name great among the nations, he does this by calling on one man and God says to Abram that he is going to be the father of the people of God. So if you open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 12, we're going to read the first nine verses. Now the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarah his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered and the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. And when they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, to the oak of Moreh. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring, I will give you this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord, who had appeared to him. From there he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going toward the Negev. There are a few things that stand out to me from these nine verses. First of all, I find it ironic that God promised to make Abram's name great. Think about the irony of that. Just a couple of chapters ago, or just a chapter ago, we had seen where, where God scattered a group of people because they sought to make their name great. And here we have Abram, who is being obedient to what the Lord is telling him to do. He is getting ready to go to the land that God will show him. And because Abram is willing to be obedient and do what the Lord has said for him to do, God says, because you have submitted yourself to me, I am going to exalt you. I am going to make your name great. God's crazy economy where the first shall be last, and the last shall be first, 
where he must increase and I must decrease in God's upside down economy. When we lift him up, he lifts us up. The second thing I find interesting in these verses is Abram's response to God's call on his life was one of not just obedience, but it is radical obedience. He did not know where he was going. God said, I want you to leave this place and go to the land that I will show you. When was the last time you did something not knowing what the end result was supposed to be? I mean, most of the time, we not only want to know the plan, but we want to know the plan that came up with the plan, and we definitely want to know the destination, right? Before we will set out, in fact, we, we sometimes even point, there's a scripture that says that we are to count the cost, we are to, to, to measure, we're to, to, to find out what it is. But in this particular case, it's kind of like we've been looking at on Wednesdays, if, if you want to walk on water, you got to get out of the boat. If Jesus is telling you to get out of the boat, if God is calling you to go to the land that he will show you, the only appropriate response is yes. Radical obedience. Going to the land that God would show him. It's interesting that as we continue to follow God, one of the things we discover is that with each step of radical obedience, God reveals to us the next step of radical obedience. But understand, just because we are following God does not mean it is going to be easy. Radical obedience is hard. Amen. Radical obedience is difficult. And I don't know where we ever got this idea that if we follow God, if we follow Jesus, then everything is just going to be easy in life. It's not the way it works. You see, God says to, to, Adam, to, to, to Abram, I'm going to give you this land. And so Abram follows God. Imagine what happens when Abram gets to the land that God shows him. He says, okay, now here it is. And he goes, uh, God, excuse me, there are people here. Th these people live here. What, what am I supposed to do about them? Well, that's going to come later. The land that God gave to Abram was already possessed by the Canaanites. And the struggle to possess the land was going to be great. Now, now, here's what we need to understand in this relationship that we have with God. God gives, God gives the land, but Abram's descendants had to possess the land. The gift is God's grace. Possession is our volitional act of faith. Paul said it like this, by grace we have been saved through faith. There, there is a volitional act. There is something that we have to make a conscious decision that we are going to do. God says that Jesus died for the sins of the world. But his death only atones for the sins of those who place their faith in him. He gives, but we have to possess. He gives forgiveness, but we have to possess forgiveness. And we do that through faith. Everything that we do in following Jesus involves those two things. God's sovereign act of grace and our volitional response of radical obedience known as faith. We can be sure that God works in us, God works with us, and God works through us to accomplish his unstoppable plan. God called Abram. Later he would change his name to Abraham in order to accomplish God's plan. Now again, Abram is the, the name itself means father. Interesting, right? Since, since at 75 he had no children and yet his name means father. But Abraham means father of many nations. And so God placed Abraham's descendants in a very strategic place in the ancient Near East, the crossroads of the ancient world. All of the trade routes went directly through the Fertile Crescent, which is exactly where Canaan was. In other words, God says, I want you to be my people. 
and I'm going to plant you right here, and then the nations are going to come to you. You don't even have to go to the nations. They're going to come to you because this, this civilization is going to trade with this civilization, and they're going to come right through here, and you have the opportunity to make my name great. But in order to use them, God had to prepare them. In order to use us, God has to prepare us. That's why James, the half-brother of Jesus, wrote this. He said, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Testing times prove our obedience and prepare us for greater opportunities. God was going to test Abraham. And then he would continue to test the nation of Israel as God put them in places to accomplish his good and his perfect will, his plan of redeeming the world. First, he tested Abram's willingness to turn his back on his past. You've heard it said before that you cannot follow God and stay where you are because God is always on the move. God is always working. God is always accomplishing his perfect, unstoppable plan. And so if we're going to go with God, we cannot stay where we are. But Abram had to be put to the test. He had to be willing to leave behind everything that he held dear in order to follow God. Let me, let me ask a question. This, this is audience participation time. How many of you in the room live now in a city that you did not grow up in? Anybody? All over the room. And I would imagine that if we kind of work this out, we would find out that we all grew up in a lot of different places. Some of them not even close to here. And so in, in our world where we easily move about from place to place, where, where even if somebody goes off, we can, we can still stay in touch. We can even have video chats. We, we, can, we, can, we can FaceTime people. I mean, we have all of these different... I'm not sure we can fully appreciate what Abram did. Leaving behind everything that he held dear, his family, his security, his land, all of those things that were so incredibly important for people of that day. And God says, I want you to leave all of this behind and I want you to go to the place that I will show you. And he did it. He did it. He passed the test. And, and, and you and I have that same opportunity when God, when God calls us to follow him. I'm reminded of the hymn, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. That's passing the test. Abram, God tested Abram to see if he would pass the test of leaving his past. But he also, he also tested Abram's willingness to trust God for his present. See, tr trusting God for, for his, leaving his past behind, but trusting God for his present. 75 years old, and God says, you are going to become a father. Well, you know, probably if you're 75 and you've not had any children and God says you're going to become a father and, and your wife's not getting any younger either, probably at that point you think it's going to be pretty soon, right? Like probably within the next year, maybe two years at the most, maybe three years, 25 years. Years later, while they were still childless, Abraham went before the Lord and, and he asked the question in Genesis chapter 15, verse 2. He says, what will you give me? For I continue childless. And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus, a distant family member. He's getting older. His biological clock, it's not just ticking. It's spinning. 
and yet he trusted God's promise. He knew God was going to, he said, God, what, what will you give me? How, how are you going to do this? Here's his problem. He was thinking that God had to accomplish what God was going to accomplish in logical ways. Earlier, God had reassured him. He said in Genesis 13, 16, I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring also can be counted. You can't count the dust of the earth. Now this time when he comes to him, he says, okay, Lord, I'm still waiting. God says in Genesis 15, 5, he says, look toward heaven. Number the stars. If you're able to number them, then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. In other words, chill, brother. I got this. I need you to trust me. And Abraham, or Abram still at this point, is learning this valuable lesson through this time of testing. He's learning that the God of heaven and earth is not bound by what we can see, what we can understand, and what we can explain. You know, I think we probably still need to keep learning that lesson as well. We, we probably need to be reminded, and maybe that's why we go through testing times. And Abram still had a long way to go. But in the next verse, Genesis 15, 6, Moses tells us that, and he, that is Abram, believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. Amen. Now that word believed in that particular case is a word that means to be strong. And Hebrew scholars say that it carries with it the idea of he is leaning into God, trusting God to do what only God can do. That's a pretty good place to be, isn't it? When we get to that point where, where, we're, where we, we can't figure it out, we can't make it work, and we lean into God, and we say, God, I, I don't, if you don't do it, it ain't going to be done. There'll be more struggles along the way. We all know the story of how there comes a moment where Abram and Sarah get to the point of desperation. Desperation can make you do stupid. Can you say that word in church? Okay. It can. Desperation can make you do stupid. And, and in that moment of desperation, Sarah says, look, I'm not getting any, any younger, neither are you, but, but here's my servant. You need, a, you need an heir. I know God, God, God will bless this. God, just, and, and he did it. And that set in motion, that was a disastrous event that set in motion the struggle that we see even played out on our news today the war in Israel between the, the Palestinians and the Jews. But by and large, Abram passed the test. And he learned to trust God to do what God said that he would do. He learned that a promise delayed is still a promise fulfilled when that promise is from God. Now, if I promise you something and I don't fulfill that promise right away, probably the longer it goes unfulfilled, the more likely you're going to go, I can't trust him. Don't look at me that way. You'd be the same, same way. But a promise delayed is still a promise fulfilled when it is a promise from God. Abram learned that. But there would be one more test for Abraham at this point. God would test his commitment to trust him for his future. At long last, the child of God's promise was born, Isaac. At long last, the promise is fulfilled. Now we look back and, and we, we get the impression that when God says, I want, to, I want you to trust me for your past, Abram has no problem following God and trusting God with his past. Had some struggles there in trusting God for his present. But the ultimate test of his faith came when God said, I want you to trust me for your future promise that I would give you a son. I promise that you would be the father of many nations. In other words, it's not going to be just this son. This son is going to have sons, and those sons are going to have sons, and on and on and on it will go. But if you turn over to Genesis chapter 22, we see this incredible test 
that God puts him to. After these things, God tested Abraham, verse 1, and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one side of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Fathers, put yourself in Abraham's place. Forget about the child of promise. Forget about a father of many nations. Take your son and offer him as a sacrifice. I can't imagine. You talk about a supreme, ultimate test of faith. God's promises, God's purpose are bound up in Isaac. This is a test of Abraham's future. How much had he learned? How much had he, how much had he grown to, to trust God? The text tells us that he did. He trusted God. He did not waver. He took Isaac, the son of God's promise, probably about 12 years old at this point, certainly old enough to know what was going on. And he set out in radical obedience. Verse 3, so Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. And on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. And then Abraham said to his young son, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. I and the boy will go and worship and come again to you. We will come again to you. He didn't know what God was going to do. He didn't know how God was going to work this out. But we keep reading. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took his own took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them, together. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide. Every time Abraham was tested... He proved his obedience. And with each one of those, it prepared him for future opportunities. His faith grew stronger. And so we find him in this, this moment, this crisis of faith, as Henry Blackaby would call it. What will he do? Will he trust God or will he do what every fiber of his being had to have been screaming for him to do? Will he proceed with radical obedience or will he walk away? Verse 9 tells us, still believing that God would provide, when, the, when they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there, laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. Herschel Hobbes said that when Abraham lifted the blade to plunge it into Isaac's body, insofar as his will was concerned, Isaac was already dead. In Abraham's will, he had fully given his son to God. He had passed the test. He passed the test. God provided the lamb. Isaac would go on to father two of sons of his own, Esau and Jacob. 
And God would continue to test his people, preparing them for greater service. First, God tested Jacob, and I think it was all to refine his character. Because Jacob, you know, Esau was the older brother, Jacob was the younger brother. The word Jacob can mean two things. It can either mean the great deceiver or the heel grabber. Probably both intended here because he was the second son born just, born just moments after his older brother Esau. And, and they said he came out grabbing at his brother's heel. He wanted to be first. And then he deceived his father into getting that first son's blessing. Remember, Moses is writing all of this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in order to, to remind Abraham's descendants as they're getting ready to cross over the Jordan River that they are a part of this unstoppable plan of God to fill the earth with his glory. And church, that has been passed on to us. We are a part of God's unstoppable plan. And we see all throughout Jacob's life these, these tests that come refining his character, defining who he was. One writer said that Jacob's life was indeed one of shadow and light. The shadow giving way to the light once he surrendered himself to God. God changed his character. He also changed his name. Jacob the deceiver became Israel, one who struggles with God. But his life continued to be a struggle. It wasn't just the struggle that he had there. His whole process of testing that God used to refine his character, bringing him from the shadows into the light, was one of continual struggle with God. He had to fight for the woman that he loved. He had to face the demons of his past when he came face to face with his brother whom he had tricked. He learned, as we all have to learn, that what appears to be God wrestling and working against us is really God humbling us and refining us in order to bring us into submission to his will so that he can use us. Amen. Sometimes I wish I wasn't such a slow learner. Jacob went on to have 12 sons of his own. They became the head of the 12 tribes of Israel. But even in the relationships among his sons, we continue to see this struggle, this crisis of faith. Joseph, the youngest son, sold into slavery by his older brothers who were jealous of him. Now, to be honest, as we talked about in our Wednesday Bible study, he, 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 well, he didn't deserve to be sold into slavery, but, but he deserved the jealousy of his brothers. He earned it, we'll put it that way. So at this point, the story shifts to Joseph and, and the twisting path that was his life. God sent test after test after test in order to accomplish his plan through Joseph, a slave in the home of an Egyptian leader. Joseph faced temptation, a test, and he stood firm. But he still landed in prison. And there he got the attention of Pharaoh, another test while he's in prison. He goes from being a prisoner to being the prime minister of Egypt. And, and I wish we had time to really delve into the de depths of that story because it is one of the most amazing stories in all of the Bible. In fact, I think that when the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, that we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. He may very well have been thinking about Joseph when he wrote that. Because with everything that happened in his life, every twist of, of, uh, and test that came his way, God was orchestrating all of that in order to put him in a place where he could then be a blessing for his family. It's an incredible illustration. Genesis chapter 42. We're, we're about to wrap up, trust me. Y'all know when a preacher says that? It's kind of like when the weatherman talks. Genesis 42, verse 1, When Jacob learned that there was grain for sale in Egypt, he said to his sons, Why do you look at one another? And he said, Behold, I have heard that there is grain for sale in Egypt. Go down and buy grain for us there, that we may live and not die. So ten of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with his brothers, for he feared that harm might happen to him. In other words, I already sent my youngest son off with you guys once. I ain't doing it again. 
Thus the sons of Israel came to buy among the others who came for the famine was in the land of Canaan. Now Joseph was governor over the land. He was the one who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed themselves before him asking for grain. Only an incredible, unstoppable God with an unstoppable plan could orchestrate something like that. Amen. The rest of the story is that eventually the rest of Joseph's family made their way to Egypt to live under their brother's protection. And years later, years later, after their father Jacob had passed away, his brothers faced up to their sin against Joseph. And Joseph said, what you meant for evil, God intended for good. The paraphrase of the rest of that is, in order to accomplish his unstoppable plan. Wow. God takes all of the testing of our faith and he uses that to grow us to shape us that we may become more and more like the image of Jesus we know the story God would solidify Israel as a nation during their time in Egypt he would continue to prepare them to live out their calling to gather together the scattered nations under the banner of God and then he would send them back to the land that he had promised where he told Abram, I will, your descendants will inhabit this land. Fathers, let me just say a quick word to you this morning by way of application. You and I have the same responsibility as Abraham, same responsibility as Isaac, Jacob. God has placed us in a position of spiritual leadership in our homes. And he expects us to lead our families toward him. Amen. He commands and commissions us to not only declare his glory among the nations, but to begin in our homes. He calls us to a life of radical obedience. He calls us to live our lives by faith, understanding that we may not know the full details of God's will in advance. Most of the time we won't. And understanding that a life of faith is marked by ups and downs, peaks and valleys, moments of celebration and moments of utter desperation, but through it all, God is working his plan. We are living out the story. You and I are living out the story. Walking with God, declaring his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among the peoples, because God's plan has never changed. His plan of redemption is the same today as it was for Abraham. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. The story continues. The question is, are you in the story? Are you in the story? Are you part of the story? Father, I pray this morning, especially on this day that we celebrate our families, we celebrate our fathers. Father, continue writing your story. And continue, Father, allowing us to be a part of it. Lord, forgive us where we fail. In Jesus' name.